Welcome at the ESC 2015 in London. And I'm here with Marie-Annick Clavel from Quebec in Canada and with Ottavio Fieri from Milan in Italy. And we're going to discuss the changes in aortic valve disease management. And uh, I have two great experts here in the studio. So to, first to start, before we start treating patients, we have to have the right diagnosis. And we have to know which patient we're going to treat. So Marie-Annick, what is new in diagnosis of aortic valve disease? I think that the, the, the most important uh, new uh, in diagnostic in aortic stenosis is the recognition that the possibility of discordance between uh, aortic stenosis severity markers uh, by echocardiography. As you well know, we often encountered a patient with a low aortic valve area below one, but with a low gradient or low velocity below uh, 40 millimeter mercury or, or below uh, four meter per second. And in those patients that we know that they may have some patient with severe aortic stenosis, even if a low gradient. So do you think that we're going to treat more of those type of patients in the future? Now that we have better diagnosis and that we better know which patient will benefit from it? or? I, I think that, yes, we have to recognize that it is possible to have a severe AS, but unfortunately, this is not all patients that have also severe aortic stenosis, and we have to actually diagnose them uh, better than, than, than we, we, we do now. And uh, for, for diagnosis that we, we have that well known for a long time that the vitamin stress echocardiography could be useful to assess the severity of aortic stenosis, especially in patients with low ejection fraction. Right. Uh, but also now we have a new um, imaging modality that we could use and that is used more and more with, with, with the TAVI patient for, for sure or so. And this is the uh, calcium scoring of the aortic valve by computer tomography that we use more and more computer tomography in aortic stenosis. stenosis. And actually... So, so may, may I just interrupt you for a moment because uh, we can use echocardiography to measure the aortic valve area, yeah. but can you also use CT scan then to measure aortic valve area? Uh, to measure aortic valve area per se, you can do planimetry, but I think that planimetry uh, measures the, the, the uh, geometric area of the valve, not the, the physiologic area of the valve. You can measure, uh, uh, to the contrary, you can measure uh, the LVOT diameter right. and the LVOT area by planimetry metry in, by uh, computer tomography. And it's well known that the, the, the LVOT measured by, uh, L, uh, by computer tomography is larger than measured by echocardiography because right. this is often an elliptic chest, right. as, as you well know. So the correlation with what you measure with CT scan and, for example, survival is different from what you measure with echocardiography? Yes. When you, when you measure the aortic valve by, uh, by echocardiography, the cutoff of one centimeter square was well defined a long time ago and still, still yeah. uh, worked to define the mortality under medical treatment. If you, if, you, if you merge the measurement of LVOT by CT and the velocity by echocardiography, the cutoff to define uh, mortality under medical treatment is not one, but 1 but 1.2 square centimeter. And right. we have to be really... Uh, so that's uh, an important point that you make. Yeah, yeah it's yes. important to, to use the, the threshold that is, is linked to the, to the modality you use to measure exactly. the valve area. Right. Yes. So, Otavio, there are new patients coming out to us. I mean, patients who are in a much worse shape than what we saw in surgery. And so they have bad ventricles sometimes, they are elderly type of patients. So how do you think it will change the management of those type of patients who are at higher risk? Will that change? Will surgery be still the golden standard or do you see a shift here? You know, the, the good thing is that uh, we have now uh, a variety of uh, procedure, a variety of possibility to treat uh, this patient. So even a high risk patient, patient with a prohibitive risk for surgery can be treated right. and enjoy life without a disease. So this is the big news. It's not something very, very new of this year. It's something that already is going on, but now we have a solid data showing that the results with the percutaneous treatment, with the transcatheter treatment in general, are really very, very good and superimposable to surgery. Right. So that also means that we see sometimes patients that have multiple comorbidities and they are old, they have bad lungs, bad kidneys. So when should we say, well, maybe treatment is not going to solve their problems? Exactly. Um, uh, these kind of patients uh, are like, likely to have a, a stormy post-operative course and they recover very slowly. This patient we're talking about, they can stay in the hospital one, two months, 
And even after that, they continue to have problems, right. not being actually well right. in, uh, in, their, um, in their life. So I think for this particular type of patient, uh, it's not only the surgical risk, but the time of recovery, right. the time to uh, return to a normal life and to be efficient, to be back to the work, to work and so on and so on, or to the family. And this is very important. So, so we can treat a lot of patients now, even more than in the past. In the past we only had surgery, now we have TAVI. But there will be a certain point in life there where you say, maybe it's not beneficial to do anything. How, how do you see Certainly. this? You know, we have to be very careful uh, and uh, uh, to be able to distinguish between uh, uh, futile intervention right. and uh, useful intervention. Right. Because sometimes if you wait too long, if the patient is too sick, if the general condition is too compromised, yeah. then the benefit not, o not only of surgery but even of TAVI is uh, not existing anymore. Right. So right. we have really to be careful enough and to use uh, these new devices uh, yeah. only if the life expectancy is such to justify an expensive procedure. Right. So what kind of skills should we develop to, to be able to distinguish which patients will benefit? Uh, certainly, this is uh, something that not only left to surgeon and cardiologists, but also other specialists have to be involved. Right. For instance, ger geriatrician have to be taken to, to take part in the decision-making process and other specialists. Um, right. There are a lot of patients, for instance, who are, have a cancer. Right. Also, you know, there are a, lot, a lot of improvement and development has been done in this type of therapy. So we have to know exactly whether these patients are going to live long enough to right. justify an expensive procedure. Right. I think the term comes from you as skillful omission. What do you mean with skillful omission? Um, you know, I mean that um, it is uh, uh, very important to avoid unnecessary things. Right. You have to think that everything you do uh, to patient uh, has, uh, is associated with some trauma. Right. For instance, if you do two valves instead uh, of one, mm -hmm. if you do some uh, coronary artery bypass grafting yes. and it's not totally necessary, this is uh, prolonging yeah. the time of the procedure, is uh, producing additional trauma so we have really to be sure to do exactly what is needed to that patient. Right. If in a, young pa a young patient can tolerate a lot of things, you can do whatever you like, you can prolong the ischemic time, you can prolong anesthesia and so on, but when you go to a patient who is a very sick, very compromised, frail, then in this particular case you have to be very, very cautious, uh, really to do only what is really necessary only what can bring the benefit to the patient, right. nothing else. No. Right. I think we can summarize it in a way that we say the patient benefits from the better collaboration between the surgeon cardiologist and in the past. The, the team. It will better be able to tailor the need of the patient to the treatment and that uh, TAVI will expand. It will be new indications, as you said, Marianne. <laughs> uh, but it will also be that some surgical valves will be replaced now with transcatheter heart valve implantation. Yeah, there's another consideration. Um, if, you, if you approach the problem this way, there's no competition. Exactly. You are not trying to have your patient and the cardiologist his own patient. The patient right. is at the center. Yeah. The patient is uh, uh, the one who, uh, who wants the best treatment. Yes, exactly. And uh, if the surgery is involved in TAVI, the surgeon does not have, doesn't have yeah. any problem in indicating TAVI. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of thinking in silos, probably in the future the two departments will merge. Absolutely. And then you will have one department. Okay, to this treat is patients. a long way to go, of course, because the bureaucracy has to change, administration has to change yes. it all. But this is the only direction. Yeah, I think, but, I think it's a great summary. I think it's a great summary of our discussion. Uh, that, that the two specialties will merge, the patient will benefit from it, we can uh, really choose the kind of treatment that is optimal for the particular patient, and the wish of the patient will play an important role here as well. I think the patient will, of course, always like to have a less invasive treatment, and if we can offer that, I think that would be perfect for, for both. Shorter hospital stay, faster recovery, and, and we all will benefit from it. I thank you very, both very much for joining here in the studio in, at the ESC in London. We had a great discussion with Ottavio Ferri from Milan and uh, Maria Nick from uh, Quebec. Thank you all 
very much for coming here and uh, hope to see you soon again. Thank you.